Okay, so welcome to the second class of Principles of Marketing. You may have noticed on D2L that I have added a category called Class Participation. It's worth 50 points. You'll need to earn 50 points throughout the semester answering questions and participating in class. And to keep track of that, what I do is I'm informally calling this the uh, duck hunt. So I have these ducks here in this. I've sanitized the ducks so that um, you won't get any, desert, any diseases or anything like that. Although the evidence suggests that COVID is not easily transmissible by touching objects and then touching your face. It's more being exposed to somebody who's got the, the disease and breathing the same air. So I will keep track using ducks. You can earn two ducks a day. That's worth 10 points. So you'll have to have 50 points by the end of the semester. By participating in class, this is my way of making sure that you don't just sit there and like bump on the log and, you know, ignore me. Um, it's by way of, you know, enforcing like some kind of mandatory attendance in case you're just going to, you know, like be a freeloader and just watch the YouTube live stream after it's published and not come to class. I've had that problem. So you have to be in class to get the ducks. If you contract COVID, we'll have to come up with something. I may let you use the live chat feature um, to ask questions and I'll monitor that throughout the class as well. So for today's first question, we're going to talk about marketing history. And there. This over here. Try this again. Let's see if that works. Okay. All right, so let's start with, given the fact that the way we market has changed dramatically in the last 10 years, is a historical perspective of the discipline of marketing relevant to you today? Who says yes? Who wants? Macro. Yes. Why? Um, like it's relevant today because we, a lot of people don't know, but we <clears throat> work in a lot of times in our daily life. And just the way you represent yourself and put it out there, it's gonna change, it's gonna change naturally over life. Like um, say for instances, interview today versus an interview in the past may be different and they may expect you to come in on certain things so you got to market yourself <clears throat> but how is history important to that hold on one second let me again you can earn up to two ducks a day 10 points, you had a thought. What's your thought? I guess it allows us to see patterns. Okay, like it allows us to see patterns. Are those patterns necessarily relevant given the way that it's, the channels are completely different than they were in the past? I think so. How? I mean, just like, I feel like any information would be relevant if you're just looking at like how to market something like well, this didn't work in the past because cell phones weren't really a thing, but now cell phones are a thing, so maybe this will be better this way. Or, but know, isn't that an argument that history doesn't make that much, that history is not that important because it's radically different? Let me, let me give you an example. We used to say in marketing that if you did a really good job, 
if you did a really bang up job and you had great customer service and your customer absolutely loved you, they might tell three people about you. If you upset them and you had a market failure, a marketing failure, they would tell seven people. That is no longer true. If you, if you, if you piss a customer off, they will tell the world. And how will they tell the world? Facebook, TripAdvisor, Google, all of these things. I, I mean, they will get on line and they will post a review and blast you. You could withstand a whole lot in the past of negative commentary just by sheer volume of numbers and the fact that people had no reach. You know, I mean, they, they would tell seven people, but after you get over your sort of initial anger, that's it, right? I mean, you, you've told your seven people or whatever, and you, you have a tendency to, as time goes on, forget about the incident. That's no longer true. I mean, it's, and it's once it's out there, it's out there forever. <clears throat> One of the things that I noticed about students is what you post online and how you market yourself may come back to haunt you in ways that your behavior in the past never would. In the past, if you went to a party and got inebriated and were obnoxious, people at the party might know, but the rest of the world wouldn't know. Now, with social media and TikTok and Facebook and YouTube, everyone may know. Isn't that a radically different way? I mean, this is this this ability to reach an audience of that magnitude is a relatively very contemporary phenomenon in the history of marketing. So is a history of marketing really important given that, that we have these tools that that allow us to have enormous capability. You're shaking your head no. Well, I said I was thinking no because as the world evolves and different things come, I just feel like the old is the old and the new is the new. Okay. I I think that a lot of people feel that way. Why do you have to take history? Why is it important history that you human behavior typically Okay, so history repeats itself. One of the historians that I like, whose name is William Durant, says that the only lessons of history is that people don't learn the lessons of history. And we do repeat ourselves over and over and over again. And we make the same mistakes over and over and over again. You're seeing that, I used to teach a course called Political Marketing. You're seeing that in Afghanistan. When we left Vietnam, the same thing happened. There were all of these people that had helped us and, and, and it was the fall of Saigon was, I mean, this is history repeating itself because we didn't necessarily learn that lesson of history. And so I think what the discussion here is leading to is that yeah, maybe the modes of communicating and maybe the impact of communicating are different, but we can see that if we can learn certain tools and techniques that you can follow in principles of marketing, you can apply them to modern technology because people do behave in relatively predictable and, and consistent ways. So although the, the method of transmission and the reach and impact of that transmission may have, have changed, there are still some fundamentals in terms of communication 
and how we influence people that have stayed consistent throughout the history of, of marketing. You got another idea? No, just a, more like a question. So like um, with understanding like the past mistakes and stuff like that with today, since it's so radically different, we try and understand the mistakes that were made when like the printing press came around <clears throat> and we started reaching like people through newspaper to the internet nowadays. That I think like the correlation. There was a huge, again, disruption in the way and the reach of of information with the printing press. And you see a similar disruption in today's, and I think there are striking parallels that you can have in terms of the impact that that technology had and the similarities that that technology had with regard to being analogous to the technology that we have today, which is the internet. When the printing press, I mean, we think that the internet has had this huge impact and it has had a huge impact on marketing and the way we market and the reach that we can get. But at the time that the printing press came along, that had enormous uh, impact in terms of the ability of people to, to learn to read and write. Because all of a sudden, books were available to people that weren't. It became relatively, relatively speaking, cheaper to inform people. And so you saw the rise of, you know, newspapers and muckraking journalism and things like that that um, could be used to persuade and disinform people. That's That was true when the printing press came out, and it's equally true now. It's just that the magnitude of it has, has increased exponentially. So in the past, you had to subscribe to the paper, right, in order to get the disinformation. And at one point in time, when I first started teaching years and years ago, the Daily Oklahoman was one of the most expensive papers in the nation to advertise in. It was subscribed to by people throughout the country who were conservative and wanted a very conservative um, viewpoint. And it was listed by the Columbia Journalism Review as the worst paper in America. It was called the Daily Disappointment or the Daily Prayer. And it had a horrible reputation in, in in journalistic circles for being basically a propagandist machine. But you had to subscribe to it. Now you can get this information in a much more readily available format and far easier than you could have in the past. But the ability to influence is still, the fundamentals of how we do that are still largely the same the way we make appeals and arguments are still largely the same. So I think that although we've had this huge transformation in advertising and promotion and things that we think of as being marketing, in reality, the methods that we go about doing that are strikingly similar. If you look at the way politicians persuade people and the emotional appeals that they use, those were used in television Going back, they were used in radio, um, the emotional gut sort of visceral reactions that people had, and, and they've been carried forward. It's just that we now have an ability to not just influence our neighbors and communities and friends, but influence the world in, in, a, in a much more dramatic way. So I would make an argument that marketing history is important. And so what we should understand about this is the evolution of these sort of ideas in marketing and how they have subtly changed over time. And in order to understand that, what we look at are what we call marketing philosophies or eras in marketing. Marketing as an academic discipline is relatively modern or postmodern. Anybody know when the modern era began? Around World War One. Around World War One. Why do you think that? I had a class last semester uh, on humanities, and I think I think that's what I remember. 
is that they said around World War One. Why do you think World War One? Uh, but I remember the Bauhaus movement and the um, something about you know uh, the architecture of that area. Okay. So, what else about World War One might lead you to a, a conclusion that it was a more modern world? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I guess just modern warfare, uh, you know, they, they developed, the planes were first used in the combat, you know, artillery, mass combat, um, trench warfare, all, all that sort of stuff. And, okay. I mean, just technology just boomed during the war. And I'd also argue that maybe around 1850, <coughs> modern era uh, started because, you know, we had the, um, oh, what's that era called? It's when we started uh, mass producing everything. The Industrial, the Industrial Revolution. Revolution. Industrial Revolution. Okay. So that's when everything kind of got modernized, when, instead of just doing more uh, cottage houses and whatnot, so. Okay. You can certainly make an argument that modernity began with the Industrial Revolution and the ability to uh, mass produce goods and services on a, on a much greater scale. A lot of historians actually go back further than that to uh, discuss the modern period, and they go back to the Quattrocento and Italy and the Renaissance. Um, the beginning of the Renaissance is generally where we mark uh, the beginning of the modern mind, and with a thinker called Niccolo Bernardo de Machiavelli, who wrote a book that's, well, actually, I forgot the reading list. Some of you asked for the reading list, and I forgot it. I have it in my office if you want to come down. I've copied it off, so I could give you hard copies of it. Uh, a book called The Prince, which has had enormous impact on the world, and the way that we view politics as being distinct and separate from the sacred is what marks the beginning of modernity. We're now in what's called the postmodern world, and many scholars generally agree that the postmodern world begins with Friedrich Nietzsche and um, his most famous slogan that God is dead and we've killed him, right? That's, that's the idea that we've gone beyond objective reality, and we're all in the patrimony of Friedrich Nietzsche. So, in a postmodern world, the way we market has evolved subtly over time. As an academic discipline, marketing is very, very new. As a subject that we teach on college campuses, marketing is a very, very new subject. And it largely comes from the merging of two older academic disciplines, both of which I will make merciless fun of throughout the semester. One is economics and the other is psychology. Those are the two foundational disciplines that merge to form the academic discipline of marketing. But as a human activity, marketing has ancient roots. We don't know when the first civilization actually occurred. I mean, we have evidence in the anthropological and archaeological record. We think we know based on this evidence where sort of the cradle of civilization began, and we think that's in the Fertile Crescent. At some point in time, man goes from being what we might call the primitive psyche into a recognition of himself as distinct and separate from the cosmos, and at that point begins to form communities, and we see the emergence of marketing, the emergence of people engaging in specialization uh, in order to facilitate greater communal growth, hunting and gathering. You had people that were hunters and gatherers and people that were warriors and people that were, you know, making things and trading and barter became um, important. So when we get that first civilization, and again, we think that that probably started someplace like the Fertile Crescent, when we get that emergence of that civilization, we see the, the emergence of marketing as a, a behavior in people, this exchange of ideas and goods and services, right? And it starts very slowly. And for most of human history, we have what's called the production era of marketing, which is, if you build it, they will come. What movie is that from? Anybody know? The Field of Dreams, who said that? The Field of Dreams. It's a rather old movie. I'm surprised you've seen it. Why, uh, why did you like Field of Dreams and why did you watch it? Uh, I'm just a big baseball guy. You're a big baseball guy. That's really unusual for your generation. I like baseball. 
but most of your generation doesn't like baseball. It's been, it's been dying because it's a slow sport. It's like, you know, painfully slow. That's the reason I like it is because you can actually go to a baseball game with friends and you can sit there and drink beer and eat peanuts. And if you're talking, you don't miss anything. You know, it's, you're not likely to, to miss anything. Whereas with soccer or um, other sports, you've got to kind of fully engage in the, in the sport. But baseball and field of dreams. So Kevin Costner builds this, this baseball diamond out in the middle of a cornfield and the players come, right? All these old great players. And it's, uh, if you build it, they will come. That was for most of human history true. If you, if you had something that was at all useful or necessary, you could probably sell it or trade because people needed things. They weren't um, mass produced, they were scarce. And so you could, you could take your goods to the farmer's market. And if you had eggs and somebody else had milk, you could trade eggs for milk or you know eggs for textiles or clothing. And so for most of human history, we had what's called the production era. Um, and it lasted until about 1920 when we got a different era. Um, so if you build it, they will come as sort of the theme of the production era. Now, when we talk about these philosophies and when we talk about these eras, you have to recognize that people still engage in this kind of, of marketing philosophy in their business model. Even though we've moved beyond that in most businesses, there are people who still use this. Very modern companies still use this theory and this model of, of development. Apple Computer um, under Steve Jobs is, a, is an example of a high-tech, postmodern company that used the production theory. Did Steve Jobs engage in what we might think of as marketing research? Um, his idea was, I'm going to tell you what's cool and you will buy it. And we did. He was sort of the arbiter of what is going to be, you know, everyone's latest and greatest and, and hottest thing that we want. And he's foisted it off on us. How many of you, I see a lot of MacBooks in here, but how many of you have the iPhone? see a show of hands. The vast majority of people in this room have the iPhone. Is the iPhone, I have an iPhone. Is the iPhone the most user-friendly for business smartphone that was developed? You're shaking your head yes. I use it for my own business. Uh, my phone, I got the iPhone 12. It's got great photos. Um, it's got a lot of editing you can do for your photos to sell your goods. Um, you can write your descriptions on your phone. You can reach out to customers on your phone. I mean, you can do anything a computer can on a phone just about. Okay. And they pretty much are computers. Yeah. They pretty much are computers. I, I, I don't think it was the best platform for business. Yeah. I guess I guess it's really like, thank you. I guess it's really... Uh, like an age thing, maybe like since you know I grew up with my my iPhone, so I guess a lot more adept to it. When I first started using smartphone tech, I don't think that we should call this a phone anymore because you don't actually use it as a phone. Most people use it as something else. I mean, it's like a picture taking device, a you know social media, you know, player, television. It's not, you actually talk less on this device than you do anything else. It's, it's texting, it's uploading things to YouTube, posting stuff to Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, Pinterest, whatever it is that you're currently using. But it's actually not the most user-friendly when it, when, when it was launched for business. And yet businesses adopted it because it was cool, because Steve Jobs told us it was cool. The first phone that I had that was a, that was a, you know, sort of personal data communicator storage multitasking thing um, was bought for me by a company that I worked for as the executive vice president and chief general counsel. 
and it was called a Blackberry. You all probably don't remember these, right? I referred to it as my Crackberry because it, <laughs> it rapidly became, and it was by far a better tool for business, but everybody wanted the iPhone because the iPhone was slick and it was cooler than the Blackberry. The Blackberry was kind of clunky and it was odd shaped, and, but you could actually, in terms of doing business, it was actually much better because it had a full keyboard that you could touch. If you can touch type, for those of us who know how to uh, keyboard, the the BlackBerry was actually much better because if you can you can do that really fast. Can you do this really fast with this touch screen? You have to actually look at the screen though. No, you <laughs> I, I, I have to look at the screen. And autocorrect. Autocorrect. And autocorrect is horrible. Yes. <laughs> one, right. It never gets it right when I'm trying. You know, the predictive test, texting that it's doing, it never seems to get that right. And so, you know, but he, he, he decided that this was going to be what was cool, and he made it, and, and everybody adopted it. This is a very postmodern company using a very old philosophy. And it wasn't until the, that Jobs died that Apple sort of started using a more modern philosophy. He said, for example, that there would never be an iPad mini because he thought you had to have a certain amount of property in order to enjoy the product. And if you lessened that, that real estate, if you will, the screen size, you lessened the enjoyment of, of the product. Now, once he died, what happened? They came out with the, the iPad mini. Why? Because other companies were coming out with tablets that were smaller and easier to use, and people wanted them more. I mean, like having the big iPad, my brother has one of these huge iPads, and it's great until you do something like get on an airplane, and all of a sudden, it's not so great. It's great for his kids in the car where they have lots of room, but get on an airplane and you've got how much space and all of a sudden you, you want something that's, that's smaller. And so they've started to engage in a different philosophy, but you still find companies doing this. You still find companies that are, that are tech companies, that are highly sophisticated companies that are still using the production era. Microsoft is still doing this. Microsoft pumps out crappy operating systems and then they fix them on the back end. And we still use it because it's the dominant platform out there. When Microsoft got started, was it was it the best operating system? Yes. No. No. The answer is no. There were other OSs. The first thing that Microsoft did. Bill Gates didn't actually develop his first product. He bought it from somebody else. It was called DOS. And that was something, the DOS was for, you know, dirty operating systems, is what the original um, sort of acronym stood for. Or QDOS, it was called QDOS, Quick and Dirty Operating System. And it, and it was. And he, he made it better. And they've continued to do that. They've, they've launched lots of products that were not great. And they didn't engage, in my opinion, in lots of market research to do that. And, and they just sort of fix it on the back end. So we see even high-tech companies using this, this philosophy. In 1920, you start to see a different philosophy emerge, and we call that the sales philosophy or the sales era in marketing. And what this is marked by is now that we can produce stuff on a larger scale, now that we have the printing press and we can make books available for everybody, and that leads to other in industrial sort of revolutions, and we can mass transport goods across greater distances as a result of train and steamboats and all of that, and all of this leads to the great industrial revolution, now the focus becomes on selling those goods. 
it's no longer just if you build it, they will come. There's now differentiation that begins to emerge in the market. And so you have to have salespeople to go out and try and push your goods and services in the market. And so this is where a lot of the negative feelings towards sales come. We have a sales program. We have one of only about 75 to 100 sales programs in the nation here at UCO. And we have a top winning sales program. Our sales program competes at the highest levels against huge schools. We are consistently ranked in terms of wins at competitions in the top 10% of schools, in terms of wins at big competitions. And when I tell students that they should consider a career in sales, they go, you know, I want to get a business degree because I want to make money, but I don't want to go into sales. Because their impression of sales is largely shaped by this era and by a model called the ADA model, which stands for Awareness, Interest, Desire, Action. Awareness, interest, desire, action. Make a pitch. Get somebody to be aware of what you have. Get their interest. Create a desire. And then get them to give you their money. And you all have experienced this. And it's why a lot of people don't want to go into sales. Because you've been on a car lot and they've used this model. Right? Show you the car, get your interest, desire, get some action. Figure out what your pain point is, sell you, and then move on down the road. Our sales center is the Bob Mills Sales Center. It's sponsored by Bob Mills. And his current marketing slogan is no shopper stalkers. How many of you have been to Mathis Brothers? A lot of you. <laughs> what do you do when you go into Mathis Brothers? Hide you hide. <laughs> you, I mean, you, you don't make eye contact. You know, you walk through. They've got a huge selection, although it is nothing Compared to, if it, have any of you ever been to a Nebraska furniture mart? There's one in Plano, Texas. You've been to one? I've been to some. Where? Uh, in Plano? In Nebraska? What are they like? Big. They make Big. Mathis Brothers look like very, like, small. I mean, Nebraska is like, they have a, in Plano, they've got like a five or six story parking garage structure along with it. It's, it's just this huge, massive building. And Bob Mills has tried to differ, differentiate himself. I told you that the most important word in marketing may be differentiation by not having shopper stalkers. They don't, they don't like hound you. They're there if you need help, but they're not going to, to be like a vulture. And so students' sort of feelings about sales arise from this era where it was, let me get your interest, let me get your money, and then let's get on down the road. Traveling salesmen used to go door to door, make a pitch. Fuller Brush. Fuller Brush is still around, by the way, but they used to sell them door to door. Vacuum cleaner salesmen used to go door to door. Um, products that are still around today were sold door to door largely. Electrolux was one of the vacuum cleaners that was sold door to door. Rainbow, I don't know that Rainbow is still around. Has anybody ever seen a Rainbow vacuum cleaner? Yes, what was I have one. one. You have one? Yes. Kirby. What? My mom has one. Yeah, their, their, their gimmick <laughs> with the Rainbow was that it has this water tank. And so all of the dirt goes into the water and, and it's easier to dispose of. The, the dirt that you pick up 
because when you pulled the old bags off of a traditional vacuum cleaner, you let dust out. I mean, you'd pull the bag off and dust would go everywhere and you'd be left with a mess, you know, and having to clean it up. And so rainbow, it captures it all in the water and then um, you, you pour it out and it's, it's cleaner. Those were sold door to door. And people would, you know, come in, they do a demonstration uh, in the house and then try to sell you the vacuum cleaner and then, then they'd move on down the road. We still see this philosophy being used again and you can see it coming up in my favorite fall activity. I absolutely love the state fair. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's coming back last year. They canceled the fair. We're actually going to have a fair this year. It is one of the iconic American experiences. If you have never been to the fair, you need to go. I, I absolutely love it. I love it for a variety of reasons. First of all, I grew up on a cattle ranch. And so I was involved in agriculture and the state fair was where you went. You historically showed agriculture today. Most people don't go for all of the agriculture, although they still have that. They still have all of the cattle uh, exhibits and sheep judging and rodeo and, and things like that. But most people go for the food, which is just a carbohydrate addict's delight. Everything is deep fat fried and everything is better if it's deep fat fried. And it's even better if it comes on a stick <laughs> and everything is deep fat fried and it comes on a stick, deep fat fried Oreos on a stick, deep fat fried hot dogs, which are called corn dogs on a stick, um, cheesecake on a stick, Snickers on a stick. They had deep fat fried butter on a stick one year and deep fat fried chocolate stuff on a, I mean, it's all on a stick, right? It's, it's just absolutely fantastic. And then they have all of these buildings where you can see what people, and as a marketer, I love this, what they would rather have than their own money. And it's absolutely fascinating to me what people would rather have than their own money. Just walk around the fair, look at what people are buying. And there's these people that have these speakers set up and they'll have a microphone like they're, you know, Cher or Madonna, I'm dating myself here. Mm -hmm. And they're making a pitch about their Ginsu knives or their stainless steel pans that are supposed to be nonstick. And they get you to, to get some interest and then they move on. Right. And, in, in, in 10 days, they'll be gone to the next fair. The fairs start earlier uh, in the year up north. So like the Iowa State Fair, that's a big political uh, state fair that everybody goes to during presidential election seasons. They start going to the Iowa Fair. And then as you move further south, they get later and later in the season. So ours is in September. The Texas State Fair, for example, I think is in October. The Louisiana State Fair is even later in October. And so as you move further south, so these people start, you know, sort of in the northern parts of the country and they, they go from fair to fair selling knives and, and pots and uh, the latest, you know, dishwashing towel. I bought a whole bunch of these things that, you know, would expand when you got them wet and then they would contract when they dried out at the fair one year. And I thought that was great for my boat. And they just make a pitch and they get your interest and then they get your money and, and they don't really care about following up on that because next year, and you'll see the same people selling every year at the fair. And a lot of times they will have, if you go, I get a season pass and I go every day, they will have different products every year. They'll come back with, with something different. Um, one year I remember the, the big product was the sham wow for people who wanted to dry off their car rather than using an old fashioned chamois. They had this product that was supposed to be much better than, than the old fashioned chamois and they called it the sham wow. And then this guy, the next year that he was there, he was selling these um, children's toys, these horses that you rode around on that you could pump They had, and they would go rather than the traditional rocking horse, they were on wheels. And then the next year after that, he was selling something else and, and they, they, they just go from product to product and, you know, town to town and they, they sell different things. And there's not a lot of service or follow-up after that sale. It's just about getting your money and moving on to the next, to the next customer. So many of the bad feelings that we have about salespeople 
come from that era. So now let's talk about, as we move from the sales era into a more contemporary era called the marketing era, and my question to you is, is marketing an art or a science? And I'll ask each of you, I used to do this as a group exercise, but because of COVID, I'm not going to do it. We'll just do it as an in-class exercise today. Is marketing an art or a science? And each of you who wants bonus points for this needs to come up with one substantive example. What is a substantive example? That means that you have to give me a specific concrete example of how it is either an art or a science. So you might say something like marketing is an art because advertisement involves creativity. Right. I took your I took your example away. Along the lines. So that's an example of a substantive example. So is marketing an art or a science? Yes. Hold on, go. Sorry. Um, marketing, I'd say it's a science. I worked at a car dealership for three years, and I think scientifically some people just have it and some people just don't, no matter how long they try to work at selling themselves to get somebody to buy a car. I know some guys would come in, they'd be like, oh, she wants a van, and they'd be like, no, sell her that one. And they would. But he would have and you think that's you think that's science? Yeah, I think it's like some people are just more vivacious, friendly, bubbly, more open. I think I that's a technique. I wouldn't say it's like science. As so you're saying it's an art, I guess. I, I think what I think that example is I, I know people who sell, they don't engage in anything like the scientific process. They're just really good. They're extroverted people, they're good at it. And I don't know that that's a science. That's that seems to me to be a technique. Okay, so then an art. Sorry. So you're changing your answer. Yeah, I'm in an art. That's why I meant. <laughs> oh. Okay. You don't have to change your answer. Okay. I'm just not sure I agree with your answer. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, I would say it's a science because it involves um, research. Okay. What kind of research? Um, just like. Like different like patterns like okay. what worked in the past all right and how do you study that scientifically patterns that worked in the past um, i don't know you don't know well thanks some more let's see i think it's kind of like a soft science a soft to, science you kind of have to use art and language but also use science Okay. One thing I've really been noticing a lot in marketing is that we're kind of using that community sense a lot. And I've been kind of watching commercials and watch them use like community terms instead of selling something. And they're kind of appealing to the fact that we really like community. And I've seen this one commercial specifically during the Olympics. It was this Lily medicine. And it wasn't selling the fact that it was like a medicine. It was like, we've been here with you guys forever. It was a lot about community, and it's something that I think is really cool. Okay. All right. So you think it's a soft science. I think we should dig into what soft science is, maybe. So think a little bit more about that. Uh, I think it's a science because of the quantitative data you take and then all of the, like, psychological needs. Okay. That the marketing, like, goes to. Okay, so quantitative data, we can look at patterns in, in terms of prediction. So, for example, we know that coming up, uh, we are entering into what season? Fall. Fall and the what? Holiday season. So what's going to become popular things to sell? In the Pumpkins. Pumpkins, all kinds of trees for Christmas, Sandals. things like that. So, yeah, we can see this pattern. We know that people are going to buy Christmas trees at Christmas and... We can make a hypothesis about that, and we can see if we sell a lot of Christmas trees, right? And we can, you can look at the outcomes, yeah. I think it's a science because uh, first step in the scientific method, observation. Okay. You're going to observe the crowd or whoever you're marketing to, and then the psychological part of it on uh, what color wrapping sells more than this one and what sells better. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And we can absolutely look at that. And there are, uh, there are, studies that look at what how people react to various colors 
over here. I think it's a little bit of both in art and in science. It's science because of the research process. You have to go through research and you have to study what you're going to be doing, but it's an art because of the creativity method. Okay. So you got to have that imagination that you're selling something. Okay. So you can have all of the data, but if you can't communicate it effectively, you're probably not going to sell your product. Right. I mean, even if you have a great product and you have all this research that shows that that's what you uh, want to, to take to market and people want it, if you can't communicate that effectively, you might have a problem. Um, mine is similar. My answer is very similar to that. Um, I think it's an art because, as you said earlier, pretty much like the techniques and stuff. And, they say when it comes to confidence and a lot of things that you may need more emotion for, I feel like that's it just it can't be taught by science, so it's like an experience thing. That's why I say it's an art. Okay. I, I will buy that that you you can't necessarily map emotions. Yeah. It's very difficult to uh, to to absolutely with precision predict how people are going to react to something because that's emotional. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, for me, I have pretty same question with you. Like, for me, it's like, again, it's also hit art and science. For example, in the art, people need to use any technique in communication and body language as well. So it's kind of art. And for science, you need to use data and take a research of like, what people want to like, like be thinking about that, or the customer, like how to satisfy with the last product. And put it on the advertising, and they're gonna see that like the numbers, and they're gonna like uh, what should they like what should they choose the product in between this product and this product, uh, and that's work. Okay. okay. All right. So you think it's both an art and a science? Okay. I think it's an art because like a science would be more kind of set in stone what you have to do each time. It's like a process, but like selling to each person is a lot different. Okay. It's like if you're selling to an older guy compared to selling to a younger guy, it's a lot different. And you have to be able to adapt and kind of go to what they want because they, then they might have questions about different aspects of it. Okay. So you don't think you can necessarily 100% say this is going to be the effective sales technique with, with this individual. It's going to be about what that individual experiences and their emotive thought processes, which are internal and we can't really look at. Because I was well. I was selling stuff for a while. Okay. I was yeah. And it's like each place you go to, they have different concerns. Like this place may be concerned about the price, but this place may be concerned about the quality. And you just have to be able to adapt to each one. Okay. So is there a difference between sales and marketing now? Can we say that? Maybe what what your example is is sales, and that may not be very scientific. I guess I'm gonna have to come up with something else. I'm gonna start passing out markers since I've run out of ducks. <laughs> I'm gonna start passing out red markers to people who, who participate. So mm -hmm. selling is an art, but maybe marketing overall is a science. Well, but I still think, like, I mean, the marketing aspect, you have to promote it. You have to catch their attention. You have to make it a desirable product. Right. And I think that's an art because what they want to see in it. But we can figure out what people want. Yeah, you know, the I mean, we can, we, can, we can figure out with pretty accurate precision what people are going to buy. And then trying to get them to buy it may be an art. So maybe we can make a distinction between sales and marketing. And is sales different and distinct from marketing? I would say so. Let's see, I had, let me, who else had a hand up? I'm sorry, go ahead. So I think it's a science because people need to like research and review like where the target audience is. Like if you're in the suburbans, like family households, more inclined to buy like child stuff and like vacuuming, things like that. Whereas um, elsewhere it's, you probably won't sell as much in another location. Okay. All right. So we could we can break things down by needs and identify various needs in, in different groups. One of the things I got my PhD, I'm from originally from New Mexico. And 
one of the things that was interesting in New Mexico was they asked children in I think the fifth grade in Las Cruces where they were most likely to see a boat. And for those of you who don't know where Las Cruces is, it's down at the very southern, southeastern tip of New Mexico, right on the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, Las Cruces, if you know where El Paso is, which is in Texas, it's not very far from El Paso, uh, which is also on the border. And children in Las Cruces at the time that, that I was there said they were most likely to see a boat on the highway. <laughs> I will tell you that the name of the river that runs through Las Cruces and Mesilla in the Mesilla Valley is called the Rio Grande, Rio Grande, and it is not grand. I mean, it's usually by the point it gets to there, it's it's not. I mean, you think Rio Grande, you think this big river, it, it, it's not. It's like this. Sometimes it's dry. It, it's completely dry by the time it gets down that far because they've used it for irrigation. It's not like the Mississippi, which is a large river. And so it's a desert. And so kids were most likely, to, they were likely to see a boat going down the highway, going someplace else. The closest place that you could probably use a boat in Las Cruces was a, a lake that was about 90 miles north called Elephant Butte. If you ask kids in Oklahoma the same question, they're probably going to say that you're most likely to see a boat on a lake because we have lots of lakes around here. They're all man-made, but we have lots of lakes and people spend a lot of time going to lakes on the boats. If you ask somebody in South Texas, say Galveston, they're probably going to say the Gulf of Mexico is where they're most likely to see a boat, right? So you can, you can break things down. Uh, people are not likely to, to use a lot of boats in Las Cruces, so they're going someplace else. If you went to the Yamaha dealer in Las Cruces, they didn't. They had a model of a Wave Runner. That's Yamaha's brand of personal watercraft. But what they did have a lot of, because there's lots of desert around Las Cruces that's open and, and open to the public and sand dunes, they had lots of quads and lots of um, you know four wheelers and things like that that people could go out and ride. And they had one. They would have like one or two. Wave runners on the on the display floor. If you go to a Yamaha dealer in Oklahoma, you're likely to see a much larger selection of personal watercraft, small boats, things like that, uh, center consoles, and than you are in, in New Mexico. So we can absolutely figure that out scientifically, right? We we observe that there's no water there. Probably are, there's not going to be a lot of need for wave runners or personal watercraft, and so we are we're going to sell something that people can use there, which is Dirt bikes, quads, side by sides, and so that's what that's what you found, and so that is absolutely, I think, science. Who else had some see back there? I think, um, I think it's an art and science. It just kind of depends on where you live. Like, say, with your boat presentation, if you try to sell a boat in New York, you know they don't really have body of waters, but also it's kind of like geographically where you're at. Um, also, how people speak, if you're trying to sell something in the South and they use little, like, you know, like y'all or whatever. Because mm -hmm. I have friends who sell roofs and they're making, but they kind of look at who they're speaking to, their mannerisms and how they speak as well. So it's kind of an art and science. It's like if you can't change the way you speak, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. in order to sell that product. Also, the science of where you're at geographically. Because like kind of hard to sell a boat when you're living in the desert. Right. Absolutely. Okay, who else? Um, I think marketing is an art, mainly just because like art is subjective. And in a lot of ways, I think marketing is subjective. While there are certain principles that uh, you stand by and certain foundations of marketing, what you market to one person in one way may not work on the next person. So like, for example, in high school, like I did a lot of like speech and debate and I gave persuasive speeches and some audience members like the more logical reasoning while others like the more emotional appeal. And so one appeal doesn't work on everyone. Okay. Can we study that though from a scientific perspective? Sociology. Sociology, yeah. Uh, there's something called social styles, which mm -hmm. indicates how people are likely to communicate. 
Um, I will tell you the, the social style that I am is I'm a driver. Drivers are, you know, just give me the facts. I don't want a lot of emotion. Just tell me what you're going to tell me. Tell me, tell me what you said and let me make up my mind. Right. I mean, and, and do it quickly. That's, that's a driver. Other people are more expressive. They like creativity. They tend to be theatrical over the top. And if you use different language with them, you're more likely to be persuasive. But couldn't we figure out ways to, to determine people's social styles from a scientific perspective? I think that marketing involves a lot of research, which is the science-based part of it. And I think that when you make decisions on based on that research, I don't think that's necessarily art, but I think that's also science because you're because like in accounting, uh, we we make a lot of decisions based on our data, and we don't call accounting an art; we call it a science. So I think it's the same with marketing. Is it a science? It's I'm not sure. Of, I mean, it's more science. like a. I think I think accounting is a torture. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why anybody wants to become an accountant. You know, I don't know. That's, I mean, that's just like the rules. Isn't yeah. It? Yeah. But that's not scientific. Like we just we have these rules, the generally accepted accounting is it principles or practices? I can't ever remember. Principles. It's principles. Oh, I've got a room full of accountants. <laughs> you'll switch, trust me, by the end of the semester. You'll you'll be a, a marketer. Um I, that's rules. I mean, like I don't know, is math a science? No. You said no. Why don't you think math is a science? I, mean, I just think it's like a bunch of numbers. Like I also don't like math too. That's why. I said <laughs> so you don't think it's a science? I'm not sure that's a a earth shattering answer, but I'll I'll give you a, a marker um, for admitting you don't like math. Most people don't like math. It's one of the things that Americans have a tendency to say. I'm just not good at math. The difference between Americans. They've done studies on this, scientific studies. The difference between Americans and other nations that seem to excel at math like Japan and China, it's not that they're naturally gifted in math, it's just that they recognize that it's really hard and you're just gonna have to do it. Right? They just sit there and say, one of my colleagues, Wen Kai, who's a marketing professor here, came from China and he said that you know his, his mother would beat him if he got bad grades in math. Uh, uh, so he'd come home and get a beating. Um, and so you know that, that prompted him to become better at math, ultimate you know, motivation tool. Yeah. I think marketing is both an art and a science because of your target market, because with your target market, that's when you break it down into geographically demographics, but then with your target market, you need to know how to market them pro properly. And that's where the art portion comes in. Okay. Yeah, I think that's I think that ultimately what we're seeing here in this discussion is that it's not one or the other, it's sort of a combination of both. That that there are ways that we can go about figuring out what people want. And we can do that with a high level of sophistication and scientific research, far more than you might suspect. We can look at things like fMRI, and we actually had one of these machines at New Mexico State, and some of my colleagues were engaged in this kind of, when I was getting my PhD in this kind of research, looking at what people would prefer versus what they say they would prefer. And when we look at brain activity and the parts of the brain that show pleasure, we can figure out kind of whether or not they're reacting positively or negatively to an ad campaign and whether or not they're going to be receptive to that pitch, even if they say something different. One of the things that we've seen an explosion of in terms of public service marketing, for example, and this is talked about in a book by Martin Lindstrom called Biology which is spelled B-U-Y-O-L-O-G-Y, not B-I-O. Biology, the science of what people buy, is uh, smokers. We have all of these ad campaigns, and he makes an argument in his book that they're not necessarily effective. We have all of these ad campaigns on television that show the effects of smoking on people. And, you know, they go through this whole thing. Cigarette companies tell you that you'll be cool if you smoke that uh, it'll make you more popular, that the beautiful people smoke. And when people then go through the series of the ads, at the end, it shows somebody that says, would you smoke if you knew you'd end up like me? And it shows this guy that's kind of gray. He's lost all of his hair, part of a leg, 
or the woman who says, uh, if you're a smoker, let me show you what you have to do to get ready in the morning after you've had, you know, jaw cancer and lung cancer and they put a trach in. And the interesting thing about those ads was that he argues they were highly ineffective because when they showed them to smokers, the part of the brain that was functioning, they, they overwhelmingly said on survey research that they, that they were scared by the ad, but the part of the brain that was triggering while they were watching the ad was the pleasure part of the brain, which, so they were jonesing for a cigarette. And he says, the, you know, now I would argue that that doesn't necessarily mean, and this is where you get into an art and science kind of debate, that the fact that the smokers experienced pleasure while watching that ad doesn't necessarily mean the ad is, is ineffective because maybe that's not the target audience. And that's sort of an art to figure out. Who is it that you're actually trying to influence um, by those ads? It's not smokers, right? You're not, you, you hope that people stop smoking. But what you're really trying to do is you're trying to influence people to not start smoking, to not using the product. And I will tell you, I was a smoker for years and years and years, a very committed smoker. I thought my car wouldn't go without, without a cigarette. And I quit 20 years ago, um, cold turkey. It was the, the reason I probably ended up getting a divorce because I, I just quit and it was not a pleasant experience. And so I was not a pleasant person, I'm certain. But it's, it's hard. It's really, really, really hard to do. And so what we're trying to do is maybe not influence those people that are already doing it, but to influence those people that are going to consider it and tell you that it's not really what makes you attractive and beautiful and the popular people doing it, right? So I think it is a combination of both. Is everything that we teach an art or a science on a college campus, we're running out of time, so I'm going to answer this one for you. I think there may be a third category in there. Most things are, are combinations. Most things are not purely scientific. Even the most scientific of disciplines that we can think of have some creative process and some amount of subjectivity to them. What am I talking about? Physics. Physicists think that they have absolutely the most, that's the mother science. That's the foundation of science. But there is subjectivity in it in that how we go about and the questions we ask are inherently subjective. Right? The things that we find interesting is inherently subjective. And the process of uncovering the secrets of the cosmos and the universe, which are the subjects of physics, are inherently creative. So there's, an, there's a, a combination there between the two. We used to say that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. That's one of these age-old adages. It turns out that that's maybe not true. We've studied scientifically what people are attracted to, and they've used small children and babies to do this kind of research. Philosophers are now rethinking the idea that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. They set children in front of screens, and they flash pictures on the screen, and children are enormously uh, honest, right? Young kids are enormously They will just say things that, you know, like they'll see a pregnant woman and say, why are you so fat, right? Things like that. Or my brother who, you know, once he'd learned what pregnant women were, would announce to them, I know what's inside of you and how it got there. Uh, much to, <laughs> much to my, my family's horror, you know, and dismay. They, they show these young children and babies pictures and watch what they'll, they'll do with them. And they will stare at a symmetrical face like Denzel Washington far longer than they will stare at an asymmetrical face like Lyle Lovett. You all don't know who Lyle Lovett is. He was this country and Western singer, um, kind of popular in the late 80s and early 90s. And, and, and he married someone that nobody could figure out quite how he got there. It was Julia Roberts for a very brief period of time. And he's just not an attractive guy. I mean, he's got this very asymmetrical face. And children will, like, cry when, when, they, flash, <laughs> when they flash his picture on the screen. And so, you know, it, it seems to be maybe less subjective than, than we once thought. 
when they ask artists from all different cultures to paint an ideal scene, the pictures are alarmingly similar in terms of the proportionality, the perspective, and even the subject matter of, of the painting. A lot of them, overwhelmingly, they have the same proportions of sky and horizon and things. Um, they have usually a water feature in all of these pictures that, that they ask people, you know, what's your ideal scene? Um, and they, they have these remarkable similarities. And we can use math to figure that out. They can use mathematics now to figure out which songs are going to be popular. We can figure out how many types of different wallpaper. There are only 13 possible combinations, by the way. Uh, it's either 13 or 16 of wallpaper patterns. They're all, there's, there's like 13 or 16 combinations of wallpaper patterns. They all fit into that. There are different colors on them, right? And maybe different, it, rather than having birds, you have flowers or something like that. But the patterns themselves, there are only something like 16 different patterns. I think there is a third category, and that's pure logic, which is I'm not sure that math, a lot of mathematicians would argue that math is a science, but physics also has very theoretical, which is pure logic, um, aspects to it, which is highly creative and more like an art than a, than a science. How many of you watch Big Bang Theory? A few of you. Sheldon is a theoretical physicist, which means he doesn't engage in you know, experimentation. It's thought experiments. And that's a highly creative process. So I think there's a third category. Mathematics is, is an example of, you can get very abstract levels of mathematics that have nothing to do with the real world, but they're logic uh, games that make sense and have internal consistency. All right, so I'm going to stop there for today. I will take a picture of that for now. If you got ducks or a marker, come up and get your points for today. If you go over 50 points, I will let you use those as bonus points for exams.